All right. This is block six, notes number five, the rise of middle class America. Uh, and right behind me, you see uh, a portrait of Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, who wrote a famous book He was uh, called Democracy in America. De Tocqueville was a French aristocrat who came uh, to the United States in 1831 just to kind of travel around and see what the country was all about. And he traveled widely and extensively uh, in America. And his book, uh, Democracy in America, is still, to this day, 180 years after its publishing, um, an incredibly important work if you want to understand uh, who Americans are uh, and about American culture and who we are as a people. Um, one of the things um, in Democracy in America that always struck me and kind of made me think was his talk on um, cooperative associations, that the United States in the 1830s was truly uh, a country with a very limited government, that a person could live, really, their entire life almost, uh, and the only contact they might have with the federal government was through the post office. Uh, that there was very few federally built roads and not so many federally built canals, that Americans did not depend on government uh, when they needed something. Nowadays, if there's a problem, everyone runs around and says, what can government do to fix it? But that was not the case in the 1830s. Um, and that was one of the things that de Tocqueville really kind of fixated on. And he said, this is why Americans are free. It's because they don't depend on their government to help them, they depend on it themselves. Uh, and in America of de Tocqueville's day, and right through the 20th century, if you wanted something done in your community, you went and found a bunch of like-minded people, and you formed an association, and you did it with them. Um, they were led by important community members. You would go find, you know, the wealthy businessman, or the guy who had been a colonel in the army, and he would kind of help you, at, or especially his wife, that women were very, very involved with these cooperative associations. And things would get done. And they could be temporary, or they could be long-term, they could be very local, or they could be very broad. Um, sometimes, you know, if, if the town wanted a library, they, fought, they would found uh, the, you know, Smithville Library Building Association, and they would raise money, and they would get a carpenter to build it and someone to design it and up it would go and then the um, the association would fade into memory. Uh, sometimes there was local chapters of national problems. Um, drunkenness was a big program so every town would have an association dedicated to combating uh, the abuse of alcohol. Uh, sometimes the problems were international in scope, international slavery, uh, Christian, uh, Christian missions throughout the world, world peace, that when Americans wanted something done, they joined together with fellow citizens and did it. And the philosopher Edmund Burke called these things the little platoons of society. There was something in America between the individual and the state. And those little platoons of free citizens in between the individual and the state is what made America strong and free. Um, besides cooperative associations, de Tocqueville's other main theme in his book is the equality uh, that is so prevalent in his view uh, throughout America as he travels through it. Now, when we think today, in 2012, when we think of the United States in the 1830s, obviously there was, you know, three and a half million slaves, and women were denied the right to vote. And um, to us, it was an era of unbelievable inequality. But for the world that, and it's very important to, to recognize this, in the world that de Tocqueville lived in, there was no freer, more equal place on earth than the United States. It is a much more equal place than Europe. In Europe, inequality was enforced by the state. That there was lords, and there was kind of middle lords, and then there was all you people down there. And you could not move between one group and the other. In the United States, inequality was not enforced by its government, by its churches, by its institutions, by its culture. That Americans then and still to this day believe that a man, no matter where he is born, can rise up, 
beyond, him, beyond his circumstances, that there are no official barriers to a man's rise. That did not mean that all Americans had equal outcomes in life. Obviously, some people are just smarter, better looking, prettier, more athletic, more hardworking than others. And de Tocqueville recognized that. He did not say the United States was a paradise of equal outcomes, everyone ending up in the same place. But what he did say was that America was a place where anyone, and any white man, let's make sure we understand that, could get rich and could make something of themselves, and could rise in society. And de Tocqueville wanted to take that back to France, which had had its Republican experiment uh, during the Revolution, which had utterly failed. Uh, and in the 18, late 1830s, France um, was ruled by a king, um, was ruled by Louis-Philippe, um, a relatively liberally-minded king, but a king nonetheless. De Tocqueville went back to France and reported that in the United States of the early 19th century there was no great wealth and nor was there any great poverty. He said, quote, that America has turned into one giant middle class. And that's the topic of these notes, this enormous middle class. And that is a part of American culture that remains to this day, that well over 90% of Americans self-identify, that is, identify themselves as members of the middle class. That even pretty significantly wealthy people describe themselves as middle class, and some pretty significantly not so rich people describe themselves proudly as the American middle class. And that's all politicians ever talk about. I'm going to restore the American middle class. I'm going to help middle class families. I'm going to help middle class children succeed. It's a very popular political thing because he's talking to 90% of Americans. Um, no American politician can ever come out and say, I'm against the middle class, because in doing so, he is going against 90% of Americans as they self-identify. So what went and created this middle class America? Um, or what were some consequences? I mean, middle class America was caused by a rising standard of living. Um, people were wealthier. They could afford more things. They could... Um, afford finished products, they could afford lots of different clothing, they could afford to send their children to some degree of schooling. Um, they built, you know, wooden houses with wooden floors and indoor heating, um, that the United States was becoming a middle class society. And what were some, th there were some changes in the family, and this is one of the most important things about the changes in the economy and the class structure that goes on at this time. Now, we've talked about this last block. Before industrialization, work was done at home. Farmers obviously worked on their own farms. Craftsmen worked in, a, you know, at, in their own homes and then sold stuff you know, out of a small shop. You lived above where you worked. Um, small manufacturers were engaged in what's called the putting out system. And that meant that a supply, if you were a boot maker, a supplier would come to your house and leave you leather and string and everything else that you needed to make boots, and you, the master boot maker, would put all that stuff together and then put it out, the putting out system, put it out for this guy to come and take. And then he would come and take them and sell them, and he would leave you with more stuff to make more boots. That's called the putting out system. But industrialization and the change in the American economy was changing the American family, and especially the middle class family, in a fundamental way. Now to make money, you had to leave home. You had to go to work. You had to go to work in a factory. And the breadwinner, the per usually the man, the person who made the money had to leave home and go to work where he worked six days a week for at least eight to ten hours a day, and this would have huge social consequences for the country. Because he's not home. And in his absence, it is going to be his wife that picks up the slack. That the husband had previously kind of controlled the household. Dad's word was law. Well, guess what? Now dad is gone most of the waking time. 
And therefore, the authority in the household, just because he's not there, nobody planned this, his authority passed on to his wife. Frederica Bremer, a, a, a feminist, an early feminist from Sweden, remarked that American women, and de Tocqueville remarked on this too, this was a big thing Tocqueville saw, she remarked that American women were, quote, the center and the lawgiver of the home. That before this, women had worked just as hard as their husbands in making money. They, on a farm, everybody's got to pitch in or you starve. If the husband's a boot maker, the wife might be the one selling the boots in the front room. That before industrialization, fa the family was the center of the economic universe for individual people. But now that dad has to go to work, mom is left at home. And her job in this new middle class society is to raise good children. And that becomes known as the cult of true womanhood. Catherine Beecher, an American woman in the 19th century, said, quote, The formation of the moral and intellectual character of the young is committed mainly to the female hand. It became the social role of women to take the lead in educating their children, both secularly and religiously, and to spend time outside of your home, away from your children, was considered very simply a dereliction of your duty. That to pursue interests in a career outside of this cult of true womanhood, you were looked down on as pra practically abandoning your children. The traditional family unit, like we said, shifted. The men were not at home. So it used to be, let's put it this way, it used to be that the husband and the wife together were in charge of both things economic sustenance, keeping the family alive materially, and they were equally involved in the upbringing of their children. Well, now with dad out of the house working, dad is responsible for the economic and material well-being of the children, and mom's sphere, if you will, becomes their cultural and educational upbringing. And there were some serious results and consequences to this. Middle-class women were shut out of economic life. That if you were a middle-class woman with children, and most middle-class, the vast majority of middle-class women had children, you were no longer involved in the nation's economy. The gap, the social gap, the cultural gap between the rich, excuse me, between the middle class and the poor increased. Poor women still had to work. And they were looked down on for having to work. They were looked down on because working, all that working meant was they were not at home to successfully raise their children. Children themselves became more important. For most of human history, children were seen as workers. As soon as you were three years old, you had a job on the farm where you're collecting eggs. And you pulled your weight as soon as you were old enough to do so. And you were useful as labor. Twelve-year-old boys could help dad in the fields. The more kids you had, the more labor you had on a farm. Someone would take care of you when you were old. But now that children are supposed to be, they're precious. They're loved. They're little precious babies. We're not going to make them work. We're going to develop them into fine, upstanding young citizens. And because each individual child became more important, the need, and dad's still making the same amount of money, he can't feed as many children as easily. Because children become more important, and because it costs a lot of money to have children raised correctly, the birth rates across America fall. In cities and towns, especially in the Northeast and in New England, birth rates fall from six or seven children per woman to three or four. Now, out on the frontier, where there was still only farming for the most part, birth rates remained high. But in the areas of the country where this new, vast middle class was bubbling and boiling up, the birth rate went down. Children began to become idealized as paragons of innocence and goodness, and parents began to, began to take a more active role 
in their child's upbringing and in their child's life. The child as the cherubic angel dates from this period. Now, as difficult as raising children is for women, this job of raising children left women with a lot of spare time, especially middle class women, especially upper middle class women that could hire servants to do the domestic chores. And what this did is it the education for women began to increase. And many of the reform movements that we're going to talk about uh, in the next section were run day to day and led in many cases by women who had this time now. Middle class and upper middle class women would take the lead uh, in the fight against drunkenness, on prison reform, abolition, women's rights, that the, these women tasked with educating their children, in the end, educated themselves as well. Education. Education in middle class America became something that was very important, especially in this new middle class area in New England, the Middle Atlantic, the Northwest. Now, in America, in New England, in the old uh, North, in the old Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, New York, New Jersey, up through New England. Most children went to school some of the time between the ages of 5 and 10 for some months out of the year. That Americans were a literate people. Most everyone, men and women, could read and write. The schools that people went to were private and charged fees. If you were poor, you went to school less because you could afford school less. Um, if you were a little bit better off, you would have a little bit more schooling. The teachers uh, were usually young, unmarried men, just kind of passing through town, waiting for something better to come along. That teaching was not a respected profession. It was something you did until you got a better job, and then you moved on. Pupils learned the, the three R's, and if you don't know what the three R's, you should. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. And if you learn enough reading, writing, and arithmetic to get by, you were educated enough for most jobs in most places in the young United States. That's all you needed to get by in real life. Because guess what? You're never going to need calculus in real life. You're never going to need to know who Alexis de Tocqueville was in real life. That education served back then to get you through real life. And once you could get through real life, you were educated enough. In New England, the birthplace of all of these reform movements, comes the common school movement. Now, from the very first days of the Republic, Jefferson especially was saying that the key to a free Republic was an educated citizenry. The people must be educated. The only way the people would not be a mob was if they were educated. And for reformers of the day, that meant free schools supported by public tax dollars, administered by the state with standards for teachers. And that became known as the Common School Movement. And it was led by two men from Massachusetts, a man named Henry Bernard, and more famously, a man by the name of Thomas Mann. Mann and Bernard believed in the improvability of the human race, just like Jefferson did, through education. They were both Whigs, and they got the Massachusetts legislature in 1837 to pass a law providing for free public education in the state. The first such law in American history. Massachusetts was the first state to provide free education for its citizens. The movement spread, and throughout the country, except in the South, by 1850, all states were providing free public education. Mann had another important role. He was instrumental in attracting young women to the job of teaching. With women largely shut out of the economic workforce elsewhere, Mann encouraged young women, unmarried, couldn't be married, had to be unmarried, encouraged young women to take up teaching. Now, he sold the women on this as something to do before they got married, and he sold the school boards on this because you didn't have to pay women as much as you paid men back in the 1840s. And for women, 
many women, millions of women, it became the only profession they would ever in their lives have before getting married and settling down to the cult of true womanhood. And these schools found incredible successes. Not only did they teach kids reading and writing and arithmetic and a little bit of basics in science and literature and things like that, but in a nation of immigrants, and in the 1840s and 50s, you started to see lots of large-scale immigration again to the United States. The schools Americanized millions upon millions of immigrants. People of different ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, class backgrounds would all be lumped into the same classroom where they would be forced to get to know each other. And the prejudices of your parents were disproved right there when you sat next to someone who was not like you and you realized that they were a normal kid just like you were. And that went a long way in turning immigrants and their children into citizens that public education in the United States has a long and successful history. Uh, and it helped make this country who we are. It helped make us Americans. And that is still, I believe, one of the main functions of public education today. That is why all of you guys, with your various and diverse backgrounds, all sit and learn American history. Because now you are sitting next to each other as Americans. I believe that very strongly. It was not only primary education, though, uh, that changed in this new middle-class America. The colleges did also. America, during the Revolutionary Period, had uh, a reputation for some pretty good colleges. Yale and Harvard, of course, but uh, Princeton and Dartmouth and many others. Um, that college was expected for people... Um, to, to be leaders, you were expected to go to college. Of the first six presidents, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and John Quincy, only Washington did not go to college. And of course, we know why Washington became president in the first place. However, of the next 11 presidents, through Andrew Johnson in 18, 1865 to 1869, of those 11, only four went to college. And that tells you more about the state of America's colleges, really, than anything. First of all, they were expensive. Most middle class, or no middle class people could afford to go to college. To go to college, you had to be rich. And the pool of rich people in the United States was simply not that great. That even Yale never had more than 400 students. The curriculum is still, so that's one problem. Another problem is the curriculum is still based on the ancient curriculum from pre-revolutionary days. Students study Greek, students study Latin, and other topics important to the training of ministers. Science was not taught at all. Um, technology was not taught at all. Anything that had to do with the new American industrial economy was not taught at all. Colleges were backwaters, where rich people with nothing better to do went uh, to blow off four years of their lives. Grades were not even in existence. You showed up to a lecture a few times, and four years later, look at that, you got a degree from Yale. Professors were not an honored profession. Professors were not a respected profession. Um, you became a professor if you had gone to college and had nothing else to do with your life. The American colleges, really, in the 1840s, seemed on their way out. That they were an institution of the elites in a vast middle-class country and had no real role. But faced with the threat of extinction, the colleges themselves changed. That in the 1840s, um, and by 1850, both Harvard and Yale began to offer courses in the sciences in which grades had to be earned. You had to prove that you had learned something to get credit for the course. Colleges in the West started sprouting up, offering subjects in the mechanical and agricultural arts. If you ever, especially out in the Midwest and in the Great Plains states and out West, you see colleges like Texas A&M. A and M. That A and M means agriculture, agricultural, and mechanical that they were colleges dedicated to helping people grow in the new economy. The, me uh, the mechanical and the agricultural arts. Oberlin College admitted its first woman in 1837. Um, 
and college changed. College changed for the better. College changed uh, to be more uh, reasonable for its purpose, uh, or for a new purpose. College got a new purpose to kind of train people in the new American economy. But that being said, even by 1860, only 2% of white men went to college, 1 in 50. A handful of white women, and obviously no blacks or Indians, went to college by 1860. College was still, by the time of the Civil War, an experience for the rich, and not that important for the rest of America. The rest of America educated themselves on their own time, and adult education and mass literature became important parts of this new middle-class culture. When you join the middle class, a lot of people like to prove that they're in the middle class. And today, that means, you know, buying a 3 Series BMW, or having a 67 million inch television hanging on your wall. That that's the sign of having arrived. In the 1840s and 50s, arriving in the middle class meant that you wanted to show that you had some culture that you were not just a money-grubbing individual with didn't know anything about art or literature or philosophy or science so people sought to put off the impression that they were a vast culture I'm gonna try sitting in this position now. this led to a huge increase in the amount of reading that people did Sometimes it was not particularly cultured. Comic books became very popular. Trashy romance novels became very popular among the lower middle class people. But many middle class people also read great works of literature. Americans were reading. Before the radio, before the television, before the internets and the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Google Pluses, Americans read. And then they formed groups to talk about what they read. And they called these groups the Lyceums. And everyone in town would get together under the heading of a Lyceum, and not only would they discuss the books, but they would invite, uh, invite guest lecturers, famous authors or scientists, to come and give a talk. Uh, they worked to establish libraries where anybody could read, uh, even if they couldn't afford it. That This was another example of uh, de Tocqueville's cooperative associations, that people were trying to better themselves through education. People also read newspapers, uh, lots, that dailies, multiple dailies in every city uh, appeared in the 1840s and 50s, some of them attracting a little higher uh, class of people, some of them a little lower, but even the lower class newspapers, you know, with gossip and crime stories and social scandal, still cover national and international news um, and gave people an education in the world around them. So let's take a couple things and add them together here. An increasing middle class lifestyle, one. The belief in the perfectibility of mankind, uh, as was shown by the reform movements that we're going to talk about. Things like getting rid of alcoholism and reforming prisoners and getting rid of slavery and giving women's rights. So Americans believed, uh, as they had from colonial times and Jefferson, that society was ever improving and perfectible. So the idea that um, society is perfectible, the middle class lifestyle, and a reading culture led to a profound effects on art and literature in the Western world, including the United States, and the movement that arose due to these things is known as Romanticism. Romanticism has nothing to do with the idea of being romantic. Uh, in the sense we normally think about it. It does not have to do with holding doors for women or buying cheesy flowers on Valentine's Day or movies, you know, by about books by Nicholas Sparks that make you cry. Romanticism was a name given uh, to the philosophy of the early to middle 19th century that was a revolt against the cold logic of the Age of Reason. That the Age of Reason taught that your logic and your reason and your brain were all that you ever needed and mankind was fundamentally a logical and reasonable and rational creature. Anyone who has ever had a crush on a girl 
where anyone who has ever been brokenhearted over being dumped will tell you that a human being is not entirely a rational, reasonable, and logical creature. That there is more to us, that we have emotions that play a major role in who we are. So what is this romanticism? Romantics believe that change and growth were the essence of life. That feelings and intuition were more important than pure logic. The way we, we feel about something. What are you going to do? Well, I feel it's right. That's a romantic idea. Differences amongst us are stretched. It's okay to be different. We're all unique. We have heard all of these things before. These are romantic ideas. Nationalism, though, is a good thing. Nationalism is the feelings and the power of the people united. We are all proud of our country. That's a romantic feeling that expresses itself in lots of different ways. Within the country, though, individualism and optimism and ingenuity and emotion are good, and fundamentally, romantics believe that you, the individual human being at birth, is good. And you are only corrupted by a corrupt society around you. That the baby coming out of, you know, the womb is a perfectly innocent creature and only becomes bad when the evilness of society around you corrupts you. American Romanticism found its greatest expression in the ethereal philosophy known as Transcendentalism. Transcendentalism literally means the world beyond the senses. The world that we cannot see or hear or touch or taste or smell. They believe, transcendentalists believe, that human beings were part of nature. And since nature was divine, human beings were divine. That they believe that your intellectual ability, your ability to use logic and reason did not define you because people could transcend their capabilities and their facilities and their faculties. Transcendentalists had faith in themselves, they had faith in the decency of the universe, and they said that anything that gets in the way of you developing as an individual is suspect at best and counterproductive at worst that organized religions, bad. Organized government, bad. Organized companies, bad. That anything that got in the way of you becoming who you were supposed to be, like I said, unimportant at best and counterproductive and bad at their worst. Why? Because they only got in the way of your individual achievement. The two greatest American transcendentalists were two New England, there's New England again, men by the name of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Emerson looked at the industrialization that was happening around him and hated it. He believed that it was against the spirit of nature, that it made, it took mankind from a, a, a natural being into a being ruled by the clock and the rules and the factory line, and he hated it. Um, he felt that Americans should stop copying Europe, stop copying industrialization, seek inspiration in nature and their immediate surroundings. He believed in self-reliance and an extremely limited government. His pupil, Henry David Thoreau, David Thoreau. Where is he? There he is. We're going to have to come up with a better way to do that. Thoreau practiced what Emerson preached. He was an extreme individualist, perfectly happy to be a majority of one and completely undependent on society. And he coined the phrase, 
If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drum. That one, if a person is a little strange, a person is a little unusual, perhaps it is because he marches to the beat of a different drummer. And in 1845, he decided to put his theory to the test. On his friend Emerson's property, there was a pond. And by this pond, Thoreau built a cabin. And he lived in that cabin completely alone for two years. And he wrote a book about his experiences, uh, his experience called Walden, because it was at Walden Pond. And it is one of America's greatest works of literature. Uh, if you really kind of get into what Thoreau is saying. He discusses his experience in beautiful and moving detail, and I remember from reading in high school, he goes on for pages about ants crawling on a leaf and how beautiful they were. Um, it struck me as strange when I was in high school, but when you really think about it, watching ants is a pretty neat thing to do, and they, that nature is beautiful. Vicious and deadly, yes, but Thoreau wouldn't have believed that, but beautiful, also. Walden is also an indictment of average people who do what they're supposed to do because they're supposed to do it. And he would have indicted all of us. He would have indicted us for sitting here and going to school. He would have indicted us for wanting to go to college because everybody's supposed to go to college. He would have indicted us for wanting to get a job that made a lot of money so you could have a house and a car and a big screen television and, you know, the latest device, you know, that comes out of Apple Corporation. He would have laughed at us. He would have thought we were no better than, than beasts for it. Um... He believed that the Mexican War was immoral due to the fact that it extended slavery. Both Thoreau and Emerson were extreme abolitionists. Um, he refused to pay his taxes uh, because his tax money would have gone to support the war, and they chucked him in jail. While in jail, he wrote a pamphlet called Civil Disobedience, describing what he saw as the proper relationship between uh, a citizen and his government. And Thoreau said that there is a higher law than that of the state. That when the state's law, when the government's law is immoral, it is the moral duty of the citizen to ignore it. And that thought would inspire both Gandhi and Martin Luther King. Uh, the idea that the laws of the state might be corrupt and wrong, and that there is a higher duty above obeying the law. That's Thoreau's great contribution to ethics uh, and the world in the modern times. He inspired both Gandhi and King. Neither Emerson or Thoreau participated in the reform movements of the day, however, because both of them felt that America was too far gone to even be saved. They lived their lives as they wanted uh, between them and the Lord God, I assume. There were other romantic writers, some of whose names have become the most famous names in all of American uh, literature. Edgar Allan Poe, who I'm sure you have all heard of. His dark stories and dark poems are full of romanticism, full of the qualities of mystery and imagination and flight and the occult and the mystery of death. Uh, his most famous work is probably The Raven. Um, which, if you haven't read, you should. Uh, the Fall of the House of Usher, The Telltale Heart, um, The Pit and the Pendulum, The Murders uh, in Rue Moore, my favorite, uh, A Cask of Amontillado, um, and the sense of mystery and doom and feeling and ins the, the fine line between the sane and the insane uh, always plays a role in Poe's works. A Tortured Soul. Uh, Poe was. Married his cousin, who was 13 years old, was an alcoholic, died in the gutter. Uh, if he were alive today, they'd stick him on Prozac and he'd be fine, uh, but then we would have lost all that wonderful writing. Another romantic uh, author was Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, many of you have read The Scarlet Letter this year. Hawthorne's stories about New England are filled, are tales filled with guilt and sin and pride and isolation and redemption and all these illogical not reasonable feelings that we have that make us who we are. And Hawthorne spoke to those. Uh, his two famous works are, of course, The Scarlet Letter, the story of Hester Prynne and um, her, you know, adultery. 
So they said. The House of the Seven Gables is another one. Herman Melville has to be mentioned in this breath. He was... Melville was too aware of the realities of the world to be a proper romantic. Um, he was much traveled. And started out writing romantic stories. He wrote stories of faraway places, um, faraway places in the South Seas where he traveled on ships and people ate up his books because they were about fantastic and mysterious and faraway places that no Americans would ever actually go to and they liked reading about them. But as he lived his life, he came to realize that the world is also filled with evil. And when he sat down to write his magnum opus, his greatest work, you cannot qualify it as a romantic piece of writing. And that work is my favorite book of literature ever, Moby Dick. Moby Dick is a story of good and evil, of sin and courage and death and faith and insanity. It is pro it, Many people consider it, and I agree with them, it is probably the greatest American work of literature ever. Um, and one of the greatest novels ever written in the English language. It was not appreciated in his day. His people, or not, not his people, but citizens and readers saw Moby Dick, and um, Melville himself called it, it was a work broiled in hellfire. Um, and it turned people off. People did not want to read about this insane Captain Ahab who takes his crew to the edge of the world chasing a, a, a phantom, a monster, who he assumes to have human qualities and does it. It's a wonderful book. Um, read it. Watch the movie if you want. Moby Dick is one of my favorite works of literature. But it was not appreciated in its day. Uh, and because of that, Melville kind of fell from favor very quickly. Um, and his work was only kind of rediscovered after his death. Um, but, like I said, I can't speak enough about Moby Dick. It's my favorite book. Our final romantic writer is a poet, perhaps the most famous and greatest American poet ever to live, Walt Whitman. He was the poet for America's common man, which was perfect in an age of the common man. They celebrate commonplace things, nature, love, sex, the normal things of romantic and feeling and emotional human life. Uh, his greatest works, uh, it, was, it was put together in a, a book of poetry called Leaves of Grass. Uh, it shows a love for America, especially those from the Civil War. He served as a nurse uh, in the Civil War, and he became one of the most popular and best poets in American history. Um, there are many more romantic writers, and if you ever take a course on American literature in college, I'm sure you will run across many of them, but Poe and Hawthorne and um, Whitman and Melville in his special kind of uh, detached way are all part of this American romantic tradition. This tradition that grew up due to this middle class America that grew up uh, in the 19th century that Al Alexis de Tocqueville did such a wonderful job observing and describing. And a lot of it is still with us. So that's that.